I'm with Mr. David K. Johnston, columnist at Reuters, lecturer at Syracuse University. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, what do you think the most important thing regarding the crisis is that everybody should know? That this was caused by decisions of policy, and many people saw this coming. Uh, there's this great lie being told now that nobody had any idea, nothing could be done about it. And that's just sheer nonsense. We made policy choices. These were bad policy choices. There were people who warned about it. Uh, there were people, including me, who wrote that there was a housing bubble going on, which was an element of this, but unregulated insurance, which is what credit default swaps are, uh, uh, betting, gambling, uh, under the guise of uh, uh, Wall Street uh, investment. Uh, all of these things resulted from our decision to dismantle a very successful um, regulatory regime that for 45 years, 50 years, uh, served the country very well. Okay. And when do you think it all started? If you had to put a date on it, when do you think this dismantling really began? Oh, it all started with the rise of the University of Chicago theories, Milton Friedman was behind. I mean, if you want to get a specific date, uh, 1970 or so, Milton Friedman wrote his famous New York Times Magazine piece saying that the only duty corporate managers had was to their shareholders. So you have a factory in your town, you don't matter. You spend your whole life as an adult working for the company, you don't matter. The only thing that matters is people who own shares of the company, even though they may only own those shares for a year or a month or even a minute. And this distorted thinking that is not conservative, it is not based on human history, it is based on radical ideas that have been passed off, partly because of bad reporting, as conservative, uh, started the ball rolling. Uh, then we had the um, beginning of loosening up some regulations, which was uh, in many cases an appropriate thing to do. But when the American public decided to elect Ronald Reagan, it was a complete romp for the people who wanted to eliminate regulation. Every society in the history of the world, all the way back to Hammurabi, has regulated banking. And the notion that we can have investment in banking and securities and insurance and not have them regulated is not just crazy, it's what put us in the jam we're in now, and it will happen again and again and get worse until we recognize that we had a sound system. Uh, do we need to tweak systems over time? Sure. But we need to recognize that these are things you have to regulate. Okay. You mentioned uh, bad reporting going on as part of this. I was wondering, as a columnist yourself, your opinions on that, examples of some of the bad reporting that got us into well, this mess. Well, first of all, let me point out, there's lots of very good reporting that took place in the New York Times, where I used to work, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, where I also used to work in some other places. Uh, but what most people get is television, and most of what passes for reporting on television is put on by people who couldn't report their way into a job at a weekly newspaper. They're actors, uh, only they're not good enough to work as actors, so they pose uh, as uh, journalists on TV. Um, but the fundamental problem is that most journalists are in the business of accurately quoting what other people tell them. They don't write on their own authority. They tend to be re reactive to what's happening. And they don't spend very much time digging through the public record. Uh, that's what I do. I've broken lots of big stories out of Washington from my home in Rochester, New York, by simply studying the public record. A tiny, tiny handful of journalists who do this kind of work. And then the other problem is that because most journalists don't operate on their own authority, if no one is complaining, then you don't hear the other side of the story. And the Wall Street people, of course, give money to both Democrats and Republicans, uh, which is why I say there's only one party in Washington. It's the party of the greenback. It has different wings on issues like uh, uh, civil liberties and foreign policy, but it's the, policy, it's, it's the party of the greenback. And it is, we have a government now that is of, by, and for the top tenth of one percent in this country, and especially uh, people who are in finance. Do you think it'd be possible to reform the current system without some form of campaign finance? Reform? No. No. I mean, the, 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 the Citizens United decision uh, is to the expansion of corporate power what the Big Bang was to the singularity. It is the entire universe. 
and the Supreme Court justices who wrote, who wrote and decided this case have ignored history. At the beginning of the found at the beginning of this country, corporations were tightly controlled. They were strictly limited. They had a single purpose. They were allowed to exist for 20 years, typically. And they had to prove a social benefit to justify their existence. And hiring people was not counted. We've now adopted this idea that, uh, contrary to the teachings of, among other people, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, who warned that you cannot take these soulless entities that are designed to be efficient vehicles to um, conduct activities and retain earnings, you can't give them political rights or you'll ruin the country. Uh, but we have, again, people described as conservatives in the press, but who I think very clearly that uh, Chief Justice uh, Roberts, uh, Justice Scalia, and um, uh, Justice um, uh, Kennedy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Thomas, uh, are radicals. And they are often ahistorical radicals. And, and Justice Breyer has even written opinions where he has pointed out that uh, Scalia is using manufactured history that does not exist. Um, moving forward, what do you think the most important thing is? The first thing we should try to tackle. Oh, that's actually sense, that's yeah, that's question, actually very but... tough. I mean, we're not going to change anything until there is a significant change in our elected leaders. Our elected leaders put these rules into place. Uh, all of the Republican candidates are proposing policies that would make this vastly worse. And it's quite clear, if you listen carefully to what they say and you know anything about economics, that while they have absolute certitude about what they say, they have no idea what they're actually talking about. Right, right. Uh, derivatives, as it's been pointed out at this conference today, are really just a form of gambling. They're not investing, they're gambling. It's a zero-sum game and it's unproductive. And yet, what is it that's being sought by all the Republicans seeking the nomination? To further deregulate this field which put us in this right. trouble. So that we have so much ignorance about well-established, historic, conservative principles of finance being promoted by people who call themselves conservatives is, is so deeply troubling. Um, one of the speakers of the conference today said he doesn't think that we'll start on the road to correction until we have a worse than, the equal to or worse than the 1930s depression. Democracies generally respond best to crises, and I'm concerned that he may be right, and I find that very troubling because I think there is a distinct risk if that happens of a revolution in this country, and if we have a revolution in this country, Pol Pot and all of his violence will be reduced to an asterisk in history books. And do you see a role for the press moving forward? How should it change? What can it do to better the situation. I, I, yeah, I, I think that we need, particularly among the leading mainstream press organizations, uh, the New York Times, as I said, where I used to work, the LA Times, the Washington Post, to have better quality economic reporting. There's a website called Beat the Press, where every day Dean Baker, who's a liberal economist, beats up on the press for awful economic reporting, particularly the Washington Post, which just writes utter nonsense to anybody who understands economics. Um, and so the, the role of the press here, first and foremost, is we've got to get journalists who understand economics and understand business, not just how to quote people. They need to know how to read a balance sheet. Uh, you know, you ask most business journalists what an acid ratio is, and they'll go, what? I, I don't cover chemistry. Uh, you know, these are just fundamental things that we have to understand, and we don't. And so this is a major problem for the press. Um, one of the things about Reuters, which is specialized in business journalism, is that we have lawyers and, and uh, accountants and people who are actually understand this stuff writing about it. Uh, Bloomberg, our biggest competitor, has some of those. And there are some very good reporters at the Washington Post, New York Times, and the LA Times, but there's an awful lot of garbage. Uh, Cy Hirsch, the great investigative reporter, used to say about the New York Times, um, you know, you pick up the paper and you can sit there and on the front page read the greatest journalism human beings have ever produced. You move over one column, pure crap. <laughs> well, well, on behalf of New Economic Perspectives, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. It's been a pleasure, and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Bobby.